All right, we are now recording, so let's get going. Um, so today we're going to be talking about functional Rust. So what is functional programming and why is it something that we have in Rust? Well, Rust is a multi-paradigm language. So multi-paradigm means that it's not just one way of programming. So there's imperative programming, which is basically just run this line, then this line, then this line. There's object-oriented programming, which is imperative programming, but based around objects and involves all of the uh, components of objects and how you'd want to use them. There's functional programming, and that's what we're talking about today, um, at least a little bit, and then there are plenty others. And so today we're talking about functional programming. So what is functional programming? Well, functional programming is the idea of not being uh, in a imperative programming sense. So basically, functional programming takes pure functions does not have shared state or mutable data or side effects. And so the idea is you create functions and what you put in, you'll get out every time regardless of how you call the function. And so this is compared to object-oriented programming where the state is usually going to be shared and it's going to be uh, combined. So if you run, say, a birthday method on a human class, then every time you run the birthday method, the age is going to be one higher than it was before. Whereas if you create a birthday method in a functional programming language, it's just going to always give out the same output um, just because it doesn't have any shared data. So uh, this is the key component. If you're taking anything away from what is a functional programming language, it's that it's a pure function without shared state or mutable data or side effects. So this should hopefully mostly make sense, but it will probably make a little bit more sense when we put it into context. So this, uh, if we look, I just realized I forgot to make an announcement. Give me one second. So yeah. Uh, going back to the uh, question about pure functions, right? So what is a pure function? Well, every input has the same output. So consider f of x is equal to 2x. f of 2 is always going to be 4, right? It's never going to change because you put in 2 and the next time it'll be 5, right? And so when you have that, it's known as functional programming because it's never going to change and it's always going to be the same. So what about a random function, right? If I call a random function, I might get 42, I might get 75, I might get 36. I don't know what number I'm going to get. And so, well, reasonably anyway. So a random function is not going to give the same result. And so as a result, it's not a pure function. So a side effect is any application state uh, change that's observable outside the called function other than its return value. So this would be something where you have, say, a birthday method, right? And so you return the age, but you're also not going to return, or you're going to age up the class, right? That is not a shared state, or that is a shared state, so you're going to run into an issue because it's having unintended side effects that you didn't see. So, yeah, that is uh, side effects. And so the next component to functional programming is that I... Uh, functional code is usually more concise, right? It's more easy to predict because there are no unintended side effects and it's easier to test than imperative or object-oriented code because the same thing that you put in every time is always going to give you the same output. And so if you're unfamiliar with it, functional code is going to seem a lot more dense at first and it's very difficult for newcomers to look at it. And so when you're first getting used to functional programming, it's going to be very, very difficult, but as you get used to it, it becomes much easier to learn. So the first big feature of uh, functional programming is the idea of first class functions. So first class functions are functions that can be treated like variables. And so in languages that have first class functions, a function can be passed as an argument to other functions, it can be returned by other functions, and it can even be assigned as a variable. So I hope this makes sense, but it's probably going to be easier if we take a look at it in code. So let's take a look at an example. So first class functions are typically referred to as closures or anonymous functions. And they're called anonymous functions 
because you can save in a variable and pass arguments to other functions um, or you can save functions that you can as variables and pass them to other functions. So they aren't functions that have a name like your typical function. So we refer to the anonymous function using the name of the variable that it's referring to, but it's not a name function, right? So if I create a function and then set it equal to a variable called my func and then create another variable called my function two, right? Then if I set the second variable equal to the first and because of ownership, the first is now invalid. The second one is now going to have the um, is now going to be the function name. So unlike functions, however, closures can capture values from the scope in which they're defined. This is probably the most tricky part about closures, but it's super important because it allows you to do some really cool stuff. So let's take a look at closures in Rust, right? So here's a normal function, right? We have just a function that will take in a number, add to it, and return it. So how do we make this a closure? Well, the simple answer is to start by removing the name and function, right? We know it's some sort of function and because it's anonymous, as we said, we don't need to give it a name. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to add these bars and these bars tell us this is an anonymous function instead of a typical function where you have parentheses. So this is the next step. And so this would actually work as a function or as a closure because it tells you exactly what to put in. It tells you exactly what to put out. And if I turn on the laser, so yeah, you have the input here, you tell it what type, you have the return and you tell it what type, and then here's what it returns. And so this is great, but we can make it even smaller. So what we can do is we can remove the types and just infer them instead. So now we just have X and then we infer that we're returning back X in some changed way. So now what we can also do is uh, put it on the same line because this only has one statement, right? It would make no sense to put this on a separate line just because it's one statement. So we, what we can do is we can put it all on one line and now it's a super clean, super easy to read function, right? So notice that when we're doing this, right, we use the vertical lines to specify the parameters, right? So if we wanted to add two numbers, we'd have X and a Y um, or whatever, right? We could put those inside of these brackets just like we would with a function, except we don't have to define the type because it can be inferred. So yeah, as I said, if we had more than one parameter, we just put a comma in between and uh, there we go. So after the parameters, we could place cur curly brackets if it's multiple lines, but it's optional if we only have a single expression. And so this is all seen in this example where we change it to just be x equals x plus two, right? So let's start off with our first poll question. Let me set up the poll bot. Okay, so our first question is, first class functions allow you to treat functions like any other variables, true or false? If you have any questions, now is a good time to drop them in Twitch chat in the uh, Discord. Okay, I'm going to close up the bot. Okay, so now that we have the answer to that, um, well actually, yeah, so everyone put true, which is the correct answer. So the reason it's true, um, just to like be clear, is because as we said, it allows us to treat functions like any other variable because they're anonymous functions. So true is the correct answer. So Poll question number two, which I'm going to put into the channel now, is which of these is a valid closure? And so feel free to put in your answers now.
All right, I'll be closing the poll in another 10 seconds here, so make sure that you have your final answer in. All right, so it looks like uh, a few people put one and then the rest put three. So the answer is one. And so remember, uh, actually, interestingly enough, all of them except for three are correct. So the reason that one is correct is because remember, we can use these pipe um, bars to say, here is the um, inputs, and then we just define the output, and then we give it the value. This one, we've simplified that because we have Rust infer the inputs and outputs, and on top of that, we just are doing it all in one line. And then this final one, we not only infer it, but because it's all in one line, we can remove these curly braces. This one is wrong because uh, the um, parentheses are not the correct syntax for closures. Remember, you always want to be using these vertical bars when using closures. Okay, so here's an example of a closure. So in this example, right, we have let add closure equal and then x equals x plus 2 just like we had before. So what this closure will do is just add um, 2 to it. And so what we can do now is we can say the result is equal to add closure of 2. And so as you can see, by doing this, all we have to do is just put all of this inside of this variable and then we can call it like a normal function. So we refer, we refer to it to an anonymous function because the name of the variable can be named anything and can be renamed. So it's not a named function, right? If I were to put another line in here that said, let uh, closure equal to this, then we'd be calling it using closure instead because add closure would no longer be valid. So let's look at this example, right? So this is why an anonymous functions are so important because anonymous functions, what they let us do is create arrays of functions. So this is an example where we have a transformations list. And so in this case, what we're doing is we are moving everything over to the right by five, and then we're multiplying it by negative one. So we are moving it up and to the right by five, and then we're reflecting it. So let's take a look at what that looks like in a little bit of a larger example. So now we have these two closures. And so what we do is inside here, we can create a loop that says, for every transformation in my list, then transform that coordinate. And so what you can see here is we go from 0, 0 to 5, 5, because we do plus 5 on both. And then we reflect and get negative 5, negative 5. And so this is a really great example of how we can use closures to actually go through our data and um, change things in a much easier way, right? Because if I wanted to change um, the transformations that I'm making, all I have to do is put it up here. And I can add infinitely many of these. So yeah, if we look at the playground and run it, you'll see exactly what um, I was talking about there. So yeah, we get 5-5. Five, five, and so let's say I wanted to um, do something like, um, we'll do um, times x. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to square it. And so now you'll see we get 25, 25 because we go from negative 5, negative 5 back up to 25, 25. So we've now oscillated it back the other way. And so we can add infinite amounts of these and it will just immediately work because all we have to do is give it a new type and then a new example or a new uh, transformation. And so this is an example of where closures become really important is because we can use them to change a lot of different things. Now keep in mind, this is not actually the most efficient way to do this. There's a better way. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute. In the meantime, though, let's take a look at this. So this is something really cool where we can have a closure that will capture values from this scope, and then we can use it somewhere else. So what we can do is we can say, hey, x is 2, and then here's this closure, and then we could return the closure and keep x for us. It will return x back somewhere else later on. And so this is really useful if we want to capture a value before we go somewhere and use it later on for that function. So now this is a really interesting concept because we can now take this idea of closures and apply it to this idea of higher order function. And what a higher order function is, is it's a function which takes a function as an argument, which I know is kind of crazy. And it could also return a function instead, or it could do both. And 
So let's take an example of that, right? A map function or the map function in Rust will take a function or a closure and a list and then it will apply that function to every element in the list. So if we take this example, right, we have let v1 equal this vector and then we need to find a vector and then for the second part what we're doing is we have this second variable v2 and then we say take that vector make it iterable which I'll talk about in a second and then the dot map function will say okay do this function on every element in the array so what it'll do is it'll say okay I'm taking an input and then I'm adding one to it and then it will put it inside a new vector and so the map function what it will do is it'll actually return the output of this iterator which we'll talk about in a minute and the collect is basically the reverse of dot iter so dot collect will turn the result of map back into a vector and that's what we're doing here so let's talk about this mis, uh, mythical iter right and what it does so the reason that we have that in there is because we don't know what data structure structure we're using a map on right so we could be doing a data structure where we're just doing this right if we have a list we just traverse left to right and there we go easiest solution but what if we have something like a binary tree right where each node has two children nodes and it can go on infinitely do we go from the top to bottom do we go from the left to right uh, the left to the right do we go from the right to the left who knows right and so that's why what we do is we say okay whatever data structure we have we want to be able to create an iterator so that's what dot iter is short for iterator and what it does is it tells us okay for whatever data structure we're using whatever it is no matter what give me some sort of way to linearly move across the data and so in this case what we're going to do is we're just going to say okay move from left to right but if we're doing something like a graph or a binary tree there are different ways to do it and that depends on the implementation so remember the iterator will basically be a pointer so it'll say okay here's the first piece of data when you're done with that let me know and we'll move on to the next and so rather than keeping that piece what we want to do is take all that data back and then create it into a vector and that's why we have the collect function so yeah I know this is kind of a um, heavy slide in terms of knowledge but hopefully that made sense and so yeah map will take a function or a closure and a list and then it'll apply that function to every element in the list producing a new list so in this case, what it'll do is it'll turn 1, 2, 3 into 2, 3, 4 because we're just doing x plus 1. So yeah, the output will be 2, 3, 4. So what changes there? Okay, yeah, so it takes function and an iterable. So that's why I was mentioning before. And it'll apply it to every element in the iterable, producing a new iterable. And that's why we have to use dot collect. So this is a pretty good uh, summary of the map function. And so this is JavaScript, so it'll look a little bit different but hopefully you'll kind of be able to follow along. You give it some sort of array, you say dot map, and then you can give it the input, the output, and then this will be the result. And so everything inside the map will be the function. And this is an anonymous function in JavaScript. And so what map actually stands for is morph array piece by piece. So every piece is going to go from one to two because you're just adding one to it. So. Let's do our next poll question, so let me get that set up. Okay, what does the map higher order function do? So put in your results, or your answers now. All right, I'm going to close the poll. Okay, um, so it looks like everyone put three, which is incorrect. So three is actually uh, doing something else. So what we're doing is we're taking a function or a closure and applying it to every single element in the list, right? So if we go back to this example, right? If we have one, two, and three, we're going to return two, three, and four. So we're giving it some sort of function that can be defined in any way we want and then we are putting all those elements through that function and that's what the map function does so 
keep that in mind, right? The map function, all it does is it applies some sort of anonymous function to every single element in an array or a list. So if you have any questions about that, given that um, a, high percent, a high percentage of people got that one wrong, please let me know uh, in Twitch chat or in Discord chat because uh, it would really be good to know um, what the questions are on that. So I'll give everyone a couple seconds before I move on, just so that we're clear on that. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on. So, yeah, that is the map function. So remember, it takes a function or some sort of closure and it applies it to every element in the list. So let's talk about our next higher order function. So another example of a higher order function is the filter function. And so the filter function, what it does is it will construct an iterator from elements of an iterable and it will always return, or it will do that for any elements where the function returns true. So if we have this example, right? So we have a, a shoe struct, which contains a size and then a uh, style, right? So we know how big the shoe can be and then we know um, what it looks like, right? So now let's say we're writing some sort of function that gets all of the shoes in our database and checks, okay, here are the ones that fit me, right? So what we can do is we can take in a vector of shoes and we can take our shoe size. And so what we're going to do is we're going to turn it into an iterator. So this will, uh, just like before, turn it from a vector into an iterator so that we can iterate through it. And then it's going to filter from S, right? We're going to take S as an input and S is each individual shoe in the original shoes array. And it's going to check where the size is equal to the shoe size that is passed in. So in this case, it's only going to put new items back into the list if it has the same size, right? And this is really, really important because you can use it to get rid of things that are in the list that shouldn't be um, really quickly. And finally, we just call dot collect just to put it back into its initial form and then we return it as a vector of shoes. So the filter method constructs an iterator from the elements of an iterable for which a function returns true. So as you can see, right, if let's say my shoe size is like 11, then I can take in any shoes that the size are 11 and then put it into a new uh, list and then I can just return it through this collect function. And so unlike functions, Closures can capture the uh, values from the scope in which they're defined, which is important in this case, right? Because what we're able to do is we're able to say, okay, um, give us the shoe size, right? We, we don't know the shoe size if we were to write this as a function, right? If we were to write this as a function, we'd have to write it outside of this function right here. And so instead what we're able to do is we're able to write a, an anonymous function that takes the shoe size directly from the scope in which it's defined, right? So if we look here, shoe size is defined in this function, so we're able to use it to define our anonymous function. So that is the really good example with shoe size. So if we have, for example, here, two shoes with size 11, what we can do is we can say, let the shoes that are in my size be equal, or size 10, uh, let the shoes that are in my size, um, let's find them, right? And so what we do here is we turn it into an iterator, we filter it, we collect it, and what we'll get back is sneakers and boots. So this is sort of another visual example of it in case you uh, are a more visual learner. So if we give it an array and we say we're going to filter that array um, by checking if the number is less than 10, if we look at this array, the numbers that are less than 10 are 2, 8, 4, and 6. So if we put it through the filter array, we're only, or the filter function, we're only gonna get two, six, eight, and four, just like before. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to move on to our next poll question. So let me set up the bot. Okay. So what does the map higher order function do?
right. Um, looks like Polbot might be dead. Or if it's not, it's not listening to my commands anymore. Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, so, yeah, the correct answer is not to. Oh, I put map. Um, that should have said filter. We're going to try that again now that uh, we caught that. Okay. Let me start that back up. Uh, and let me get my presenter notes. Okay. So yeah, let me try that again. All right, so feel free to put in your answers now. We'll give everyone another 20 seconds here. And it looks like everyone put their answers in. Okay, great. So I'm gonna close that question. So the correct answer for this one is one. And that's because, remember, why did it stay, oh, right, never mind. So filter, yeah. So the filter function is going to make a list from the elements where a list, um, or from the elements of the list where a function that you give it returns true, right? So if we go back, let's take another look at that, right? If we're filtering by if a number is greater than, or a number is less than 10, remember, we're only we're going to take in this entire uh, entire list, and then we're going to put it through this filter, and we can give it any function, right? I could uh, filter if num is uh, greater than ten. I could filter if num is only equal to ten, right? And this filter will return any of the values that fit this function, where you return a boolean. So the correct answer is one. Um, a lot of people put two for some reason. Not really sure how you got two. Um, to his map, um, unless you just re-click because there was a typo there. But anyway, we're, we're going to move on. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in a Discord chat and I can try to answer them. Okay, so let's talk about the next higher order function, which is fold. So the fold function is going to apply a function to an iterable and it's going to produce a single final value. So the other two applied every single item to or applied something to every single item. This one and returned a list. This one is going to apply to every single item and then return only one item. So it takes two arguments. It takes the initial value um, and so it takes that and then a closure with two arguments. So the closure needs to take an accumulator of some sort and an element. And so the closure is gonna return the value that the accumulator should have for the next iteration. So if the accumulator has one value for the previous um, element, you're going to take that in, apply some sort of change to it based on the element, and then return that for the next item in the uh, iteration. So it's similar to reduce in JavaScript and many other languages, but in Rust it's called fold, so that's how we're going to reference it for the rest of this class. So yeah, let's take a look at an example, right? So if I have let nums equals one, two, three, and I say iterate over them and fold by starting off with an accumulator of zero and for every item in the array we're going to take in the accumulator which is zero right now and then we're going to take in x and so x is the element and then what we're going to do is we're just going to return the value of the accumulator plus x so in this case what it's going to do is it's going to return six because it's going to take in one and one plus zero is going to be one then it will take in one here and then it will take in two here so then it's going to return three and then three will get three from the accumulator and three here so you'll get six and so yeah the fold function basically will take two arguments an initial value and a single or and a closure value or a closure function with two arguments and it's going to return a singular value from the accumulator so yeah, in this case, this is going to just make the sum of the all of the elements in the array. 
So here's another example of a graphical version of that. So in this case, you have a uh, array of different cooking ingredients and you can reduce it into a single element. And so remember JavaScript is reduce in Rust, it's fold. And so what you can do is you can fold all of the items by saying, okay, we're gonna make a sauce by putting all the items together. And so what you can do is you can return the sauce plus the new item that you've just cooked. And so what this will do is it'll cook the wine, the onion, and the mushrooms and put them all together and you have your sauce. And so this is a simpler example of what the fold function does, but basically it will combine all the elements. So let's do another poll question. So what does the fold higher, higher order function do? Give everyone another few seconds. All right, I'm going to close the poll. All right, so the correct answer for this one is four, and so it looks like everyone got that correct. Yeah, so it applies a function to a list and then it re reduces it into a single value. And so that's where the reduce comes from in other languages. In this case, we call it fold, but it will take all those values and bring it all into one final value for you. So let's put all this together, right? We've learned a bunch of different types of functions that we can use. And let's see how we can uh, put all of these together to make it even more powerful. It's actually so powerful, actually, that Google was able to build an entire distributed data processing system using these functions. And if you want to click this link once the lecture slides are available, I encourage you to. It is a little bit dense reading on a Wikipedia article on how it was done, but it, uh, it's really cool in terms of how this uh, methodology was used. So uh, in this example, we're going to use map, filter, and reduce, or in our case, fold, together. And so you'll see this a lot, especially in JavaScript, um, as well as other languages that are, have functional components. We use the map filter reduce format. So you'll map a bunch of data, then you'll filter it, and then finally you'll reduce it. And so here is a Rust playground that we've got. Wow, my screen is really glitching out right now. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, let's see. Okay, so it looks like we are back. Um, so yeah, looking at this uh, example playground, right? So we have a bunch of players. Let me also make that a little bit bigger for anyone. Um, so in this case, we have a player struct, and so this is basketball players. So uh, you have a name, and then you have points, and then you have a points that they assist on. So if a player, say for example, passes the ball to someone, and then they score, they get points for assisting, and then whether or not they're an all-star player. So then we declare a bunch of players here. And finally, what we do is we create this function called all-star summer. And what this is going to do is it's going to tell us the points that are gathered just from all of these different um, all-stars. So let's take a look at what it does like piece by piece. So what we do first off, I'm going to add a bunch of lines down here. so comes up a little bit better. Okay, so first off what we do is we say, okay, here are the players array, and or the vector, and we're going to take that in and we're going to turn it into an iterator. So now we have an iterator for this vector, so we have each player. And so what we're going to do to start off is we're only going to get the all-stars. So what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to filter, and we're going to take in a player, and if the player is an all-star, we're going to return true. And so what will happen at the end of this filter function is only the all-star players will be left in the list. Then what we can do is we can use the map function to say, okay, 
now that we have all of the all-stars, for each all-star that we have, let's get the number of points they scored as well as the points they assisted on, and we'll return that value. So now we have an array of all of the points that that specific all-star has scored. And then finally, all we have to do is now fold it all together. And so how we do that is we create an accumulator with an initial value of zero. We then take in an accumulator and the number of points as our anonymous function inputs, and then we just add them together and return that value. So when we run this, you'll see we have all the different points for a season, and what will happen at the end is we get the output of all of the all-stars points. And you can see here, if we change one of these to true, and we run it again, you'll see we're gonna get a lot more points now. And yeah, so we'll change it back to false and you'll see it's no longer 5,994. So that's how that basically works. It is really cool because what it allows you to do is turn all of this data into a very simple and easy to read set of functions that you can easily work with and will give you exactly what you're looking for. So let's move on to the next slide. So remember, these ideas are not just something you'll use in Rust. You can find this in Java, JavaScript, Python, um, many other languages have the idea of anonymous functions and closures and things like MapReduce and Fold or MapReduce, sorry, Map Filter Reduce or Map Filter Fold, right? So these are not things unique to Rust, but they are really well implemented in Rust and that's why we show them off during the Rust lectures. And so just to wrap up, I know this lecture is a little bit shorter than usual, but uh, here is map filter reduce in a single tweet. So in this case, you can kind of see it takes in um, the initial value of, um, not sure why the, there we go. Um, so it takes in an in initial value of corn, cow, and chicken, and it cooks it. So you get your popcorn, you have a burger, and you have an egg. And so now you can filter that for only the vegetarian options. So now you see we only have the popcorn and the egg. And then finally, we can reduce it by eating it. And yeah, so this is a very uh, comedic way of looking at map filter reduce, but maybe it helps you out. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, functional programming in Rust is a pretty simple topic just because, uh, or a pretty uh, like simple topic to grasp once you take an easier, or a, uh, more in-depth look at it and once you take a look that look at it you now get a much more in-depth way to use Rust because this reduces a lot of code that you would otherwise have to write and it allows you to do a lot of really cool things really really quickly so hopefully this level of functional programming is really useful and the next time you'll probably run to, run into this at least through your official CS classes are going to be CS421 and so you'll get to work with functional programming then but in the meantime, hopefully you've learned a little bit from this and you can use it in your everyday life every once in a while and you've learned a little bit more about functional programming, which is a really cool idea. Yeah, other than that, that was a really short lecture. Uh, I will be back on Tuesday for my final lecture of the semester, which is going to be Unsafe Rust. So I hope to see you all there because that's going to be a really fun lecture. It's not necessarily the most applicable lecture to a lot of freshmen, but it'll still be a really cool lecture for everyone to kind of see. Yeah, hopefully everyone enjoyed this lecture and you have a good weekend.